If you find this healing sleep meditation sleep story helpful or interesting, feel free to give it a thumbs up, share with someone who may find it useful and leave any comments below. If you don't want to miss any future sleep stories, you can subscribe and click the bell notification icon. My sleep stories are made with you, for you, and posted weekly here on YouTube. You can access all my sleep stories without this YouTube introduction on most streaming and downloads services like Apple Music, Amazon Music and Spotify. If you're interested in what else I offer, you can find details of all this and of my hypnotherapy and autism e-courses, books and merch in the description and on my website danjoneshypnosis.com. So I hope you enjoy this story. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift deeper to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And this sleep meditation is about an ice queen. And she lives in an ice palace, up in a land of ice. But inside her ice palace, instead of having a doorway out of the palace, she has a giant blue swirling portal. And outside in the land around the ice palace, there's lots of snow, lots of ice, strong winds. Whereas inside the ice palace, it's calm and quiet. The only sound you hear are the echoing of footsteps while walking around that seem to reverberate down the corridors and up to the top of the palace and back down again. But that portal, the Ice Queen can go over to it and can place different crystals into different locations in a device next to the portal and depending on where she places those crystals makes it so that the portal directs itself to different locations and she places a few crystals down into specific holes in that device the portal starts to whir and what looks almost like a blue cloud of dry ice or light smoke begins to spiral and that thick cloud spirals faster and faster and as it spirals faster and faster so the whirring becomes more intense and while that whirring becomes more intense that spiralling starts to disappear off to a point in the distance beyond the portal. And then when it reaches a certain speed of spinning, that distant point turns to a point of light that gradually, as that spinning continues to get faster and faster, increases in size with that point of light seeming to get closer and closer until eventually the portal is full of the view of another location. And this other location that the Ice Queen can see is of the inside of a wooden building and it's a cosy wooden building. 
in a warm environment. And she can feel the warmth coming through that portal. And she steps through the portal and steps into that environment. And she steps down onto the wooden floorboards in that location. She can see the rugs on the floor, the cosy sofa, comfortable chairs, crooked bookcases around the walls, holding what look like incredibly old books, some leaning at angles, some stacked up, some even facing the wrong way, with the pages facing outwards. And there are some that are upside down. And some that just seem to be placed back as if in a hurry. As if someone just read them and didn't give any care to how they were putting it back on the shelf. And as she waited for the person she was meeting here, she looked along the bookcases and found herself instinctively turning some of the books over, neatening them up, turning some round, placing some together that she thought were related. And then she could smell the sweetest smell of some cooking in the background. And the slight chinking sound of cutlery on crockery. And then her host introduced themselves and they walked through and there were a little blue rhino. And they're incredibly friendly. And they made her some lemonade. And the two of them went out of this home and sat on a swinging bench on the balcony, just outside the door looking out over a garden and looking out over fields and beyond the fields to what looks like a savannah and then way off in the distance the sun turning the most beautiful orange as it sets and the ice queen had to put on some sunglasses and wasn't used to this kind of heat. And they sat and they talked. And the Queen was told that someone is needed for a mission. That there's a mission that needs to be gone on, but the Queen can't really do it. And they can't do it. But the Queen can probably get the person who can. And the Queen wondered how and who, and was told that the best person to do this job, the person who's best able to find things, is the Leprechaun. And together they can summon up that Leprechaun. And so they go into the garden and the queen performs a ritual in the garden. Grey clouds begin to pass across the sky. Rain starts to fall and as the rain falls so those grey clouds pass by until the angle is just right between the setting sun, the rain clouds, and the rain still gently coming down. 
for a rainbow to appear. And the queen then goes to the end of that rainbow, to the pot of gold. And with that pot of gold, the queen finds the leprechaun and asks that leprechaun for their help. And this was the only way to summon them up and to be able to talk to them. And the leprechaun asks what the problem is. And the queen explains that there's a darkness that's been coming across the land that's been heating up the warm areas and cooling down the cold areas, making them even more extreme. And that it's able to change its shape, control the weather, and seems to be using its magic to make it so that all of the creatures of the land and all the people in the land have to keep themselves indoors and find themselves being controlled by that being. But the leprechaun is the only one that's comfortable with hot weather, cold weather, can travel on rainbows, and can create its own portals without needing to use crystals or any other devices. And the leprechaun agrees to investigate. They empty out their bucket of gold. They jump in the air. They put their arms beside them their legs together and they drop straight into that bucket and as they do it's almost like they're on a water chute they head down that bucket whizzing around that chute and then springing out in the top of a cloud and they land on that cloud and behind them is a hat. And they pick the hat up off the ground and place their hat on their head. And from up here, on this cloud, they survey the land below, trying to look for any signs of darkness or anything unusual. And as they look around, so they notice something strange they see a field full of cows. But these cows aren't just brown or black or white or black and white or brown and white. There are cows that look like they've been painted with multiple explosions of paint, with splotches of pink, bright green, red, blue, yellow. And then they notice there seems to be paint looking footprints heading from the field and then suddenly vanishing. As if something had been here and managed to get away. And as they continue looking around, they notice ducks flying en masse, not just a few ducks, but many ducks. And the leprechaun calls down to those ducks, manages to get one of their attention. And that one duck flies up to the cloud and explains that they're trying to escape that darkness that was behind them and then heads down and continues 
catching up and flying with the other ducks. So the leprechaun heads the opposite way. And the leprechaun takes his cap off, puts his hand into his cap, and he pulls out this mushroom. He takes a bite out of one corner of it, throws it in the air in a spinning motion, and as it starts falling down through the sky, it seems to get larger and larger, and the gap he bit out gets larger and larger as well. And once it falls below the cloud level, he jumps off the cloud, lands on that mushroom, thumps the side of the mushroom, and then the mushroom starts steering and flying while he continues to chew and eat that bit of mushroom. And just using leaning left, right, backwards and forwards. And the pressure of his hand on the fleshy top of that mushroom. The mushroom accelerates, decelerates, moves left, right, up and down. And he flies and he dodges through a sudden hailstorm. He flies up through the clouds to get above that storm. Can see in the distance that darkness. And he continues flying closer and closer. Before the weather seems to calm and relax. And as the weather calms and the wind calms right down. The mushroom flies down to the ground, gently twists its stalk into the ground, fixing itself to the ground as it lands. And the leprechaun climbs out of the mushroom, takes a little bit more to eat before snapping that mushroom off the ground, as if he was just picking the mushroom. And as he does so, it shrinks back down to being something just between his thumb and forefinger. He pops it back in his hat and puts his hat back on his head and continues walking in the calmness towards the darkness. And the leprechaun doesn't know what it's going to find, but feels calm and confident that they've got the skill to handle whatever it could be. And as they walk along, they head down into some woodland. They can hear the occasional sound of birds in the woodland, but the birds sound like they sound at night time. Even though, although it's dark, it doesn't feel like night time. And then they come out on to a row of houses with picket fences that look unusually normal and suburban for what seems to be the middle of nowhere. And then they thought they know where they are. They found their way to the middle of nowhere. They thought to themselves they're glad that at least they didn't turn up somewhere. It's even better to sometimes go anywhere then find yourself somewhere, but nowhere is where they wanted to be right now, so they're glad that that's where they are. Because they didn't want to be anywhere or somewhere. And they can see people, seemingly, 
in unison mowing their gardens behind those picket fences, all just gazing forward, almost like robots. And they thought there seemed to be something odd about this. And they continued on. And at the end of the street, the darkness seemed almost like a solid barrier. That it looked like it cut a building in half. They could see, under the slight light that there was, the houses, and the slight light given off by the houses. And then suddenly there was just darkness, almost like looking into inky water. And they took their hat off, reached into their hat, and pulled out a torch. And it was a torch that was a stick with a flame on the end. And the flame was already lit when they took it out their hat. And they put the hat back on their head. They held their hand out in front of them. And they walked forward into that darkness. And it shimmered, almost like dropping a stone into some water, as they walked through into the darkness. And the other side, they were surprised to encounter delight, to find themselves in a very lit up area where they didn't actually need that torch. It was a very white area. And initially they couldn't make anything out. Everything was just white in all directions. There was very little detail. And then gradually they started hearing the sound of seabirds. And then the sound of an ocean. And then could just about make out bright, almost white, with a slight tinge of green grass. As the light here seemed to be uniformly bright, as if coming from everywhere. And they walked towards the sound of the ocean. And as they got nearer to the ocean, so they could see a tree in the middle of what's almost just a field. And they could just about see in the distance that they would be coming to the top of a cliff. So they walk past that tree, they continue on to the top of the cliff. They look down and can see down that cliff, all the way down to the seashore. And they don't see an easy way down. And they decide to have a look around, see if there's a route down. And as they look around, they notice in the back of the tree seem to be a small door. So they head back to that tree. They open that small door. Notice inside the tree some steps descending. And they walk into that door, close it behind them. And everything goes dark again. And as it goes dark, so they descend those steps. Ten, nine, eight. Seven, that echoing of each footstep as they walk around that spiral staircase down. Six, five, four, three, two, one, finding themselves at the bottom of that staircase and seeing spread before them 
a tunnel heading towards the shore. And hanging in this tunnel seems to be many glass jars containing blue liquid that's glowing and illuminating the path. And then from the ceiling of the tunnel, there's what looks a bit like some blue fungus. It's like an electric blue color that's glowing and pulsating. And the blue liquid seems to be dripping from that fungus into those jars, continually keeping them topped up. And they continue to walk towards the seashore. And when they come out onto the seashore, they notice how incredibly bright it is out here again. And they see a row of rocks leading a little way out into the sea. And they notice that the sea is so calm that it disappears into the whiteness in the distance that you can't tell where the sea ends and the horizon begins, almost like a thick fog just a little way off from the shore, and the sea being so calm it blends in. And they notice some movement on the rocks, and head over to the rocks. And over at the rocks, they see a mermaid just sat there, chilling out and relaxing. And they talk to that mermaid, they explain the mission they're on to deal with the darkness, but they're unsure what the darkness is because in here, the darkness seems light. And the mermaid explains that they've been struggling with the brightness that there's a brightness that's come over the land that seems to have made it so everything is bland, that everything seems very samey, that places that were once hot are now not, places that were once cold are now just average temperature that everything seems to be settling on one temperature wherever you go. And that the brightness takes over the land. You don't get to appreciate the colours and all the things you get when there isn't so much light. And that it seems to be coming from everywhere, not just a bright sun. And the leprechaun asks if they've any idea what might be causing it, because they've headed to the darkness, hoping to find the cause, and now they're in delight. And the mermaid is in the light and has never ventured to the darkness. And the mermaid said that perhaps you can talk to the manatee. And she dives down into the sea. And she barely makes a splosh as she dives down. And a few flicks of her tail. And she's gone. And the leprechaun just sits on that shore, appreciating the peace and calm. Takes his hat off while he waits. Takes out a pack of cards. He makes a grid of cards in front of him. Turns over a card. Then the next one, and then turns them back again. Then turns over the third card. And the fourth card and then turns them back again. Then turns over the fifth card, and then the first card, 
and picks them both up and puts them to one side. And then turns over the next card and the third card and then puts them to one side and just slowly works through pairing up those cards before shuffling again, flicking those cards through his fingers, ruffling the cards, splitting the cards, shuffling them some more, and then quickly dealing them out into a grid again, and pairing them all up again. And after three goes of doing that, they hear the faintest splosh as that mermaid arrives back to say that they'd spoken to the manatee and the manatee has heard from other fish and octopus and other animals in the sea that this seems to be a problem up here on the land that that seems to be where it started that apparently there was a tree that it started in. And the leprechaun finds out where that tree is, thanks that mermaid for their help, and then starts making that journey to the tree. And they head back through that tunnel, ascend the steps, leave that tree, and as they do, they hear some buzzing in the tree, just the faintest buzzing sound, and they notice that high up in the tree is a bee's nest, and they head up, climbing that tree to that beehive, and they look in, and they can see the honeycomb pattern there, and see those bees so busy working. And they call one of the bees over and they ask if they know where this tree is, if they know the easiest way to find it, given that to them everything's just white and hard to make out. And the bees do a little dance wriggle their bums, flap their wings a little bit, and the leprechaun understands, descends that tree, and heads left, and they continue left, until they encounter something strange, they discover a goggly-eyed, monster-like creature that seems so friendly. It seems to move its head around almost as if it's on a spring. And with each movement of its head bobbing around, so its eyes wibble and wobble, almost like loose balls inside the eye sockets. And they watch as this creature just seems to walk around. And they go and approach that creature. And as they do, they notice that the creature is walking around yo-yoing. And they head over and they explain what they're looking for. That they're looking for the tree where this problem began. And they describe the tree. And this monster just starts yo-yoing out in front of them. They make the yo-yo go up and down. Then they make a triangle and they swing the yo-yo through the triangle. And then round and round. And the leprechaun understands the directions being given. About where to go forward, where to turn left and right and where to go around something and head in another direction, and then where to descend. 
And they take this monster who goes on their way. And they carry on their way. They get up and head left and carry on. And after a while, they feel that the light should have changed. The day should be drawing to an end. And yet, there's an even bright light still everywhere. That it's almost like there's an incredibly thick, low-lying fog with bright sunlight somehow shining on the back of that fog. Like the whole sky and the whole land is turned into one giant light box. And they carry on walking until eventually they see a slight dark shape against the brightness and they head towards that tree and when they arrive at that tree they notice the most unusual thing they notice that it has incredibly unusual looking leaves and incredibly unusual looking plants growing on its branches and that it seems to have unusual fruit and there's something very strange about this fruit because as they're watching so they notice that the fruit seems to be hatching and out of each bit of fruit pops a baby dragon and it pops out of the fruit, grips onto the fruit for a while, eats the bit of fruit that was there, before releasing their grip, dropping towards the ground, flapping their wings and landing on the ground. And beneath this tree are all of these dragons. And there's still dragons coming from the fruit And the leprechaun looks at how much fruit is still in the tree and realises that if each bit of fruit is going to turn into a dragon, there's going to be a lot of dragons. And these are all just baby dragons. And they're making a kind of chirping sound as they kind of try and breathe out fire. rather than actually breathing fire. A slight chirping, squeaking sound. And the leprechaun goes and looks at the different dragons and sees that some are multicolored, some are kind of an oily color, where as they move, they change color from slight greens and turquoises to slight blues and reds. Some seem to be scaly, some seem to be smooth. Some are just one colour, like red, or black, or green. And the leprechaun just watches as they all get used to flight, but none of them seem to be going that far from the tree. And they wonder, this is the tree they were directed to, saying that the problems began here. And they thought they were looking for a person or some being that was causing all this. And they wondered what was going on. And then they saw someone in the distance, in a purple cloak, they could just about make out that person's purple cloak. And they headed over towards that person. And one of the little dragons potted around their feet. And they had to try and walk around that dragon. It kept on wanting to jump up and almost wanting to just be hugged. But they managed to just pet it gently before saying that I've got to go and talk to the person in purple. And as they arrived at this person in purple, they noticed 
that this person seemed to be a little distressed. And they asked what the problem was, and they said that they came here for a day out. And as they were here having their day out, they'd been by the beach, they then took a bit of a walk, and then they tripped over. And as they tripped over, their watch broke. And now it just seems to be running backwards. But not only is it running backwards, but it's a magic watch. And so some of the magic dust that was given by the fairy as a gift, as a wedding present many centuries earlier, that they've kept in this watch ever since, has got into the workings of the watch and so it's messing with time and messing with reality because it's not just time that turns backwards and so it seems to be dividing things into lightness and dark and merging the different realities and they've been trying to stop the watch and turn it backwards but any time they try to blow the fairy dust out it just goes in their nose they sneeze a bit and it seems to just settle back down in the watch and they've been sat here for ages and standing up and stamping around and getting frustrated trying to find a solution And the leprechaun thinks, maybe I can help. And the leprechaun takes off their hat. And they take a look at that watch. They can hear the inner workings of the watch. The ticking. The moving of the cogs. They hold it in their hand and they can feel the workings of that clock. They can feel the subtle movements the clock makes while it's resting on the palm of their hand. They can see the sparkling, twinkling fairy dust moving around within the cogs, around the clock face. And they very carefully take out what's almost like a sheet from their hat. And they lie it down, but this sheet seems so light, almost lighter than air. And they rest that watch on to that sheet. They then take out some glasses that seem to have glasses built onto the glasses, and then glasses built onto those glasses. And they pop the glasses on the end of their nose and they look through all those sets of glasses and they crouch down and they get the tiniest tools out and then while that wizard in his purple robe is still stamping around and stressed out by it all the leprechaun just relaxes calms himself right down and uses his tools in his steady hand to very carefully undo every layer of that watch piece by piece and as he does so the light around him begins to fade while that watch begins to stop as if somehow everything is connected and the sounds begin to stop and everything seems to take on almost a grey like a cloudy stormy day but without any weather where there's no longer this bright white or this darkness just a steady grey in every direction 
and it makes it slightly harder to see what they're doing. So they allow their eyes to close, and they allow themselves to feel what they're doing. They know what part of the watch they're changing. They know the inner workings of watches. And they can just feel it through the tools, feeling their way deep into the workings of that watch until they've taken it to pieces completely. And then they carefully rub every cog and every spring and every bit of the inner workings of that pocket watch on that sheet before carefully placing every piece back again in exactly the right place. And as every piece starts being placed back, so that grey begins to brighten. And the weather begins to turn more normal. And it appears more like just an average summer's day except that the sun is just beginning to set here. And next to that completed pocket watch, all fixed, is a small pile of fairy dust. And the leprechaun hands back the watch, folds up the fairy dust in the sheet, ties a knot in it, and hands the wizard that sheet containing the fairy dust. And the wizard thanks them for their effort, for what they did, for their ability to keep so calm when so much had been going on around them that they panicked at creating so much change across the land. And the more they panicked, the harder they found it to focus, relax, and make the right choices. And behind you, you notice that under that tree, no more dragons seem to be being born. But the dragons that have been born are still just pottering around as if with nothing to do. And you ask the wizard if they know anything about dragons, and the wizard explains that they need to grow up in a good home, and that ordinarily just one dragon a generation would be born from a tree like this. And they take a very long time to grow, to be born. And ordinarily, an elder dragon would land and would take on that young dragon because it happens with regularity and would teach that young dragon the ways of being a dragon. but there is no elder dragon here to do that. And the leprechaun says that they know a few friends that might be able to help. And so the leprechaun takes their hat off again. They place it down on the ground. They go and drop one dragon at a time through their hat as the wizard just watches. And then they jump in the air, put their hands by their side, pull their legs in and drop into the hat themselves, heading down through that tunnel, whizzing around in that chute and then popping out behind all those dragons, 
They then turn around, pick up their hat, place their hat on their head. And then in front of them is a giant cave with a low rumbling sound coming from the cave. And they walk towards that cave. And the area around here appears very volcanic. The ground rumbles, has black stone, dark clouds. But this is as it's meant to be here. And then inside the cave, the leprechaun shouts the dragon's name. And with a loud snort, the dragon wakes up. And then sees that leprechaun down there. While they wake up, stand up and tower high over the leprechaun. And the leprechaun explains what's been going on, and that it's not the time for them to wake yet. But they need their help. And then that dragon looks down and sees all these little baby dragons running towards it. And they all run and tuck themselves in underneath that dragon as if they suddenly know that this dragon's there to protect them and help them. And as they tuck in, so the leprechaun takes their hat off again, pulls out a tiny box, and starts turning the little metal lever on that box, as a bedtime tune begins to pluck its way out. And as the leprechaun, with a slight wry smile, twists that lever, so those baby dragons begin to close their eyes, tuck themselves down, and drift and float comfortably and relax to sleep. And the leprechaun says, I'll leave this with you, and leaves that little music box. And the dragon says that they know what to do. They can find homes for these dragons. But it means they're going to have to wake up other dragons to do so. There's not normally so many dragons around all at once. The leprechaun thanks them for their help. Before putting his hat back down again, jumping back through it. And then appearing back at that home. Meeting with the Ice Queen and the Blue Rhino. And explaining to them what went on. And at this point, there was many others who'd made it to the house. Who had all come here to try and find out what was going on. And if there was any way of solving it. And then they see that it was the leprechaun who solved it. Who managed to remove the darkness. Who explained that it wasn't really a darkness. That through the darkness was light. And was another world experiencing a similar problem. Only in their world and in their reality. Through that universe. Light was taking over, and that it's all because of a broken watch. But they fixed that watch now, and all the realities are back to normal. And the rhino made up some food, and they all had a large garden party. before heading off in their different directions. As the sun had set, the moon had risen in the sky, the stars were glistening overhead. Then at the end of the day, the queen 
went back through that portal, back into her palace, and headed to bed, and settled down, drifting and floating so peacefully and comfortably asleep, knowing that across all the multiple universes the world was back as it should be, and drifting and floating so peacefully, so comfortably asleep.